themselves. So it's something that needs to be fairly cheap, fairly easy to find and obtain, and uh, relatively environmentally friendly. Uh, so there's kind of three things that I've been checking. Uh, first one is determine if you can just flush your line well or build your boat. Um, just open the drain, flush it for a set amount of time. Does it remove the villagers that are left in the residual water after you leave the lake? Second is to determine if you could go to a commercial car wash. Um, they don't have the high temperature, high pressure that um, some of the, the boat wash stations they have like in out west or in the, you know, the Lake Champlain, Lake George area. And is it reasonable enough to remove adult mussels that are uh, attached to a watercraft if they happen to show up to a boat launch and the stewards notice that can you send them to a car wash and expect them to come back without mussels. The third is to test the toxicity of some fairly common household chemicals um, to see how they treat or kill the adult mussels and the villager larval stage of the mussel. And I'm kind of focused on the third aspect now uh, for this talk. Um, so the two chemicals I tested, uh, sodium chloride, uh, so regular salt, and then potassium chloride, uh, which you can find as a substitute. Um, if you have like a heart condition, you have a, a dietary restriction on uh, sodium, uh, you can buy the, the no sodium salt at Walmart. And from reading in the literature, potassium um, itself, no matter kind of what it's in, seems to be a pretty good um, chemical to use on the tracinid muscles, whether it's zebra muscles or wagon muscles. Concentrations, I picked the, the upper limit for the adult concentrations is 30,000 parts per million, um, which is a little bit less than seawater. Um, if you look at it from the standpoint that they're freshwater organisms, we know they don't live in salt water. Um, how long does it take them to die if we put them in salt water? For the villagers, 10,000 parts per million of the sodium chloride. Um, that's in a, a few published papers from quagga muscle research um, out in Colorado. So we want to see how that fares in the zebra mussels um, since they're in the same genus. And then potassium chloride, uh, 2,500 parts per million, uh, same thing. Uh, it's published for, for the quagga mussel, and it's also published for zebra mussels, but using a formalin secondary treatment. Um, but trying not to promote people using formalin at home, so you want to see if it'll work by itself. So for the toxicity to the mussels, uh, adult mussels, uh, I went up to the boathouse almost all the way to the north end of the lake here, uh, scraped mussels off of rocks with a paint scraper, brought them back and put them into these mesh bags. Uh, put the bags in this aquarium that had a uh, fresh lake water getting pumped into it. Um, that way they would get acclimated to being in the bags, a fresh water um, that's been shown to by providing uh, flowing water, it decreases stress, so you're less likely to have mortality from handling. And then, before I put the mussels into the tanks inside um, that had the chemicals in them, I would check them for mortality, because um, a lot of times mussels are covered in sediment, and when you let them sit, they kind of get cleaned off a little bit in the bags, and you can tell if you had chipped the shells or anything like that. Um, if that happened, I would remove them. And these are the aquariums in the lab um, with chemicals in them. And they also happen to have mussels in them in this picture. Um, so I had every dowel would have 10 bags of mussels, and I'd put 10 bags right in every aquarium. Um, once every aquarium had mussels, I'd take one out from each one, that's times zero. Um, after that, every exposure period, uh, which was 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, 24 hours out until 96 hours, um, I take them out and I put them back in the aquarium, which is outside the window there in the greenhouse. They have the fresh water flowing. That's because some chemicals, uh, especially potassium, have a knockout factor where they make the mussels appear dead. 
and if you let them sit in clean water for a couple days, they uh, wake up. So you can falsely call them dead um, and get ripped apart in following peer reviews. <laughs> uh, then I'd let them sit for at least 48 hours, and then I would check them for mortality. To do that, I'd dump them on a paper towel and kind of dry them off so I could handle them, check them to see if they were dead or alive. Um, there's, it was usually pretty obvious if they were dead. Um, they're open, kind of like this one. Um, if they were kind of open, but I wasn't sure, I would just poke a probe in the opening in their valves. Um, if they closed right away, they're alive. If they didn't respond, I assumed they were dead. And then I would um, measure the shell length and enter into Excel 1 with whether it was a dead or alive muscle. That would let me get mortality averages and also um, be able to compare sizes of dead and alive muscles to see if size is impacting their um, resistance to the chemical. So here's the results for the adults with sodium chloride. Um, the salt water, seawater equivalent, um, caused mortality at 24 hours of exposure. It's right there. And then the 10,000 milligrams per liter, which was the one they had shown worked on Belgers, um, didn't work until the 96, you know, four days of exposure. For potassium chloride, a um, lot nicer looking curve from the standpoint of trying to get rid of them. Um, the 30,000 milligram per liter caused uh, complete mortality at six hours. And the 10,000 uh, milligrams per liter caused complete mortality at 12 hours. So a, a lower concentration of potassium chloride worked faster than a higher concentration of sodium chloride. And then to test on the villagers, you have to wait until it's summertime when they're spawning. Uh, drove out in a boat, kind of right out here behind the, the resort, and uh, did some plankton toes. Brought them back to the lab. I would concentrate them down so that the allotic belgers and a little bit of water so that I had a higher sample size. Uh, count how many I had in a milliliter and um, try to get about 100. Um, so now I'd have 100 belgers for every chemical sample after that. You have to use cross polarized light. Um, otherwise, when you first look at it, if you don't have the filter on, uh, that's what it's even once a belger looks like, just a black blob. A little hard in this picture, but they get a nice cross on them with like a white halo around them. Um, as soon as you put the filter on, you can tell right away that they're a Belger and they're not just something from here, you know, that you got caught in the net. That's usually what they look like um, when you're looking at them the, with the filter on. Um, so I put one milliliter of the concentrated Belger solution. Um, into the 24 milliliters of chemicals, um, let them sit for their exposure period, and then I would take them out, um, filter them, and rinse them with lake water to try to rinse the chemical off them, and then put them into, um, I made these Velger holding devices, um, which was a, a test tube essentially that I was able to put a filter on the bottom, so I flipped it around the top, flipped it upside down, so they would have fresh water coming up through the filter, put them in a test tube rack in an aquarium. They're there getting fresh oxygenated water um, during the whole time. Afterwards, uh, check them for assessment right then, and then also 24 hours um, at 24 hour intervals until my control groups had greater than 50% mortality. Uh, for the, the statistical analysis, I had a, a low replicate number. I only had three replicates per each. Um, so we did a arc sign square root transformation and an analysis of covariance to see whether uh, concentration of chemical, or this one was chemical or time, or the combination of your chemical and exposure time um, impacted mortality. The results, I wrote it out because the graphs after this are extremely hard to read. Um, there's just a lot there. Um, so for sodium chloride, the 5,000 milligrams per liter was the only concentration that had recovery. Um, it had recovery 
between the 24 hours after removal and 48 hours after removal assessments. Um, 10,000 and 15,000 micrograms per liter did not have any um, Bellinger recovery. Um, that's consistent with what had been uh, previously published for quag muscles. And the control groups remained at below 50% mortality until uh, the 48 hour assessment. Jasmine chloride, um, the lowest concentration, 500 uh, parts per million, had a had some Belger recovery between the second and third day after removing from the chemical. Um, all the other concentrations did not have any recovery. And the control groups remained below 50% until 72 hours. So right there you can see there's a, a little bit of recovery and right there, so that's the 18 hour exposure for 500 or 5,000 milligrams per liter. And then a little bit again at the 24 hour exposure. What's nice is 18 hours at 10,000 milligrams per liter worked. Um, the other published uh, results said it would be 24 hours, so it's a little quicker, so it's good to know that it, it worked a little faster here. And this is why I wrote it out. This, I couldn't find a way to make this graph look nicer um, and easier to read. Um, essentially, it's the concentration, and then it's 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. Um, and you do see a little bit of recovery here that's at that low concentration. So the and ANCOVA results, um, it was a significant model. Um, and looking here, treatment was significant, so was time, um, but not the treatment and time interaction. Um, this is what the muscle, this is the muscle felger. Um, you can see the shells open. That's usually what the potassium does, potassium chloride, it, it knocks them out and keeps them open. That's why they would use formalin in the old days, as the shells would be open, they pour formalin in and just kill them. Other things to consider um, with the results, um, the exposure time is pretty long. You need, um, for the adults, six hours, you know, six hours, whether it's adults or villagers. Um, for the potassium chloride, 24 hours for sodium chloride. Um, so you're not gonna be able to you know, spray the outside of your boat with it, um, but it is something you could do um, if you put the plug in your live ball or your bilge, fill it up and let it sit, and then drain it. You could also use that as something, um, fill a bucket and put any gear into the bucket that you can, you know, ropes, nets, things like that, that can sit there. The cost is something to consider. Um, unfortunately, you know, for our, the first round of testing, we used you know, high-grade lab salts, so they're on the order of $40 a kilogram. Um, you're not going to expect someone to pay that. Um, you can find this sodium shield. Um, it's supposed to be a, a sodium alternative water softener salt. Um, we can't seem to find it around here. Um, we, it says you can get it on ACE's website um, down to it. Get it for $1.43 a kilogram, um, which is pretty cheap um, considering what it, how much you can make for a, especially a bag that size. The no salt alternative that's at Walmart um, is on over $16 a kilogram, so a little, little pricey. And then table salt, iodized table salt, I tested that to compare it with sodium chloride, the high grade stuff, and it works if anything better, um, and it's much cheaper, a you know, dollar seventeen a kilogram. And if you, you can get rock salt or um, water softener salt, it's sodium chloride base, um, it's even cheaper. And then the the eyebrows get raised when you look at your sensitive equipment, electronics, things that are wired. Um, so you know, the potassium chloride is less less. Um, Corrosive compared compared to sodium chloride, um, it's still kind of bad. Um, we had a garbage can of it in the greenhouse at the field station, and some of the interns decided to leave things in it, um, like plant plant rakes from rake tosses. Um, after a while, they start to get eaten up pretty bad. Um, so we started a policy: if you let it sit for a few hours and take it out and rinse it, that way you get most of that ionic solution off. 
not get eaten alive. <coughs> and how do you use that? Um, converting it to the layman, layman's terms, um, 300 or 30,000 milligrams per liter of sodium chloride, um, and potassium chloride is about as dense, um, converts to 0.42 cups per gallon. Um, so that's you know, getting it to a unit that the average Joe will understand instead of telling them parts per million. Probably be smart to just tell them round up, say half a cup per gallon, um, nothing like having a little extra in there. Um, and you don't have to use it all the time. Uh, spawning for the Bellinger spawning is temperature dependent. They don't start spawning until, about, uh, until the water gets over 15 degrees uh, Celsius, um, but it really peaks uh, once it gets about 18 or 19 degrees. So there's a good chunk of the year where the mussels aren't spawning. Um, so you, you can get away with using probably like a little less, still have them use some in case there's um, a few stragglers in there. And then the solution always gets asked, well, what am I going to do with this? Um, what am I, you know, do you want me to pour it in my yard? What do you want? Um, hard to say. Um, if you can collect it, I would collect it because it's not like it's going to go bad that fast. Um, you can just reuse it. It's not like it's losing um, its effectiveness that, that rapidly compared to some, you know, some of the chemicals that dilute or you know, become broken down over time. Um, the salt is going to stay dissolved in the water. Uh, acknowledgements, uh, all my research is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund, um, and then my fellow students and some of the interns that I got to use and make them count 10 muscles at a time for six hours. Um, and any questions?
basically they're upside down, spinning in circles. It's just a very characteristic uh, effect. Um, just on a personal note, one of my first days on the job for the state of Maine in 1985 when I um, left school and got a real job um, was to investigate uh, Manhattan Kills right in Boot Bay Harbor, Maine. And so they're like, here, go out on a boat, and you know, go see what's going on. And basically, when out when you're out on the boat, the blue the bluefish were basically jamming hundreds of thousands of menhaden into the coves around the area. And that and the basically the menhaden would just use up all the oxygen in the cove. There were just so many of them, and that was literally the diagnosis. It had nothing to do with algal blooms. All it had to do was being chased around by predators. So. In the last couple of decades, though, there has been investigations of other reasons why Manhattan died. And one of them is this Phantomyces. Originally, in the Chesapeake, was blamed for this, uh, this crazy dinoflagellate that was going to come up from the bottom and grab these fish, and it got, a lot of, it got a lot of press. Well, it ended up that that was all a lot of bull, and it was really just this fungus that was infecting um, Manhattan. So you'll see these ulcer ulcerative lesions, particularly around the vent, and a lot of times that's a, that's a fungal disease. And also the, the people down in the Chesapeake that have been investigating the uh, striped bass, um, they, they have sort of these hemorrhagic lesions and then granulomas when you open them up, and that's a mycobacterial infection. And 